today asbestos, the scientific facts and challenges. Now here is a very important quote. Not only was the medical profession's reaction to the asbestos hazard often feeble, but scientists have also been among the industry's most strident defenders. There are two reasons why that is so. Corporate suppression and intimidation meant that criticism of the industry came at a price and the convergence of the economic, political and social interests of the scientific establishment and commerce. So this show summarises the science on asbestos related diseases with a primary focus on health outcomes and sources of exposure. The paper also highlights the commercial and political influences on the messages conveyed to the community based allegedly on scientific developments. As with most areas of public health and disease, there are generally accepted scientific facts about asbestos related diseases, as well as areas of uncertainties and unknowns. In terms of health outcomes, we know that asbestos is carcinogenic and exposure to its fibres causes and contributes to mass loss of life in Australia and elsewhere. There are two types of asbestos, serpentine and amiphobile. Chrysolite, white asbestos, falls within the serpentine group and accounts for more than 90% of asbestos usage globally. All types of asbestos can cause illnesses that are incurable and fatal. Diseases caused by exposure to asbestos include asbestosis, asbestos-related lung cancer, mesophilioma, larynx cancer and ovarian cancer. Among these health conditions, those associated with the most human fatalities are asbestosis, mesophilioma and lung cancer. Asbestosis is a chronic lung disease caused exclusively by inhalation of asbestos fibres and results in the formation of scar tissue in the lungs around inflammation caused by asbestos fibres. While asbestosis is not fatal, it can trigger respiratory or cardiac failure and or can lead to subsequent diagnosis of mesophilioma or asbestos-related lung cancer. There is currently no cure for asbestosis. Mesophilioma, also called malignant mesophilioma, most often occurs when abnormal cells in the tissue that line or surround the lungs, the pleura, grow in an uncontrolled way. This form of cancer is called pleural mesophilioma. This is not the same as lung cancer, which starts inside the lungs. Mesophilioma can also arise in the cells that line the abdomen, the peritoneum, the cells that surround the heart, the pericardium, and the cells that cover the testicles. Mesophilioma tumor cells may be epithelioid, sarcomatoid, or fibrous, or mixed, biphasic. Lung cancer occurs when abnormal cells in the lung grow in an uncontrolled way. It often spreads or metastasizes to other parts of the body before the cancer is detected in the lungs. While smoking is the primary risk factor for lung cancer, exposure to asbestos exacerbates the risk significantly and is an interacting factor. Now let's turn to the diagnosis and deaths from asbestos related disease. The Asbestos Safety and Eradication Agency ASEA, estimates around 4,000 Australians die each year from asbestos-related diseases, but provides no details on the makeup of those statistics. For example, it is not clear whether this estimate includes fatalities arising from exposure in non-occupational settings. If not, it is understated. In any event, this scale of deaths from asbestos-related disease in Australia is exponentially greater than most households believe. 
Our survey of more than 43,000 households found that most Australians think the number of deaths from these diseases is less than 50 each year. Mesophilioma is a notifiable disease in Australia and the number of recorded diagnoses is published each year. There is a time lag though between notifications and publication of the official statistics so the diagnoses for prior years are commonly adjusted upwards over time. Allowing for such adjustments, Cancer Australia estimates more than 830 people were diagnosed with mesophilioma in 2020. This is a record level of diagnosis, with an especially large increase in the number of female cases. The processes used to determine the mesophilioma death counts that are published in the Australian Mesophilioma Registry, the AMR reports, are unknown. Given the average survival period following a diagnosis is only 11 months, these statistics should be close to the levels of diagnosis. Turning to lung cancer, a body of medical studies investigate the ratio of causes of lung cancer deaths caused by exposure to asbestos compared to mesophilioma fatalities. These study findings vary with ratios spanning 2 to 6.6 times. Assuming 830 of the 4,000 deaths estimated by the ASEA are from mesophilioma, the remaining fatalities may include 1,660 to 3,320 deaths from lung cancer based on a ratio of 2 to 4. Asbestos-related lung cancer deaths for each mesophilioma fatality. Now looking at other asbestos-related diseases, any remaining deaths included with the ASEA estimates likely relate to asbestosis and asbestos-related larynx cancer and ovarian cancer. Evidence on the numbers of deaths from these diseases in Australia is lacking. Now we must look at the sources of asbestos exposure. Asbestos exposure is the only known cause of asbestosis and mesophilioma in Australia. Asbestos-related diseases are therefore preventable by avoiding exposure to asbestos fibres and dust. Asbestos fibres are non-discriminatory and people diagnosed with asbestos-related diseases include males and females from all socioeconomic segments of the population and all geographies. Now, while asbestos is a naturally occurring material, it only poses a risk to health in its natural form when removed or mined from under the ground. And the range of locations where underground asbestos potentially presents a risk across Australia is very limited. In contrast, products containing asbestos that were manufactured and sold by James Hardy Industries Limited, James Hardy, and CSR Limited, CSR, and others, and that are now inbuilt within government, commercial, and residential properties across Australia, present a real and substantive risk to human life. This legacy asbestos in Australia is contained within literally thousands of different buildings and industrial products, including, for example, cement sheets, roofs and insulation. These products deteriorate or break down over time and or can be disturbed during maintenance, renovation or removal. Now let's talk about safe levels of exposure. Scientists acknowledged in the 1960s that there is no safe level of exposure to asbestos. They indicated that the only safe level of exposure to asbestos is nil, zero, with any exposure presenting certain and known risks. These facts were confirmed by the World Health Organization and the International Agency for Research on Cancer in 1976 and 1977. Many published medical sources since the 1960s reference and or discuss mesophilioma cases following exposure for brief periods and or low intensity dust levels. For example, 
In 1964, the landmark article by Selikoff and others highlighted cases of asbestos-related deaths from mesophilioma, asbestosis, lung cancer and other forms of cancer in insulation workers with relatively light and intermittent exposure to asbestos. The authors concluded that the possibility of environmental exposure to asbestos had long been known and suggested many other types of trades persons would likely suffer similar outcomes. In 1967, an article in the Archives of Environmental Health noted that the occupational exposure of insulation workers or textile workers was certainly many thousand times higher than those of neighbourhood causes or family contacts. And an article published in the Medical Journal of Australia in 1968 warned of the development of mesophilioma after minor exposure to asbestos. Now let's turn to occupational and non-occupational exposures. The history of asbestos-related disease is commonly described as arising in three waves. The first wave of claims came from people directly involved in asbestos mining and the manufacture of asbestos-related materials. The second wave of claims including tradespeople working with materials containing asbestos, as well as persons in close contact, such as those washing clothes with asbestos fibres on them, or children playing in asbestos dust, and the third wave of claims includes people exposed peripherally to asbestos products, including through home renovations or maintenance. The linkages between asbestos exposure and sufferers of asbestos-related diseases within the first and second wave categories are well acknowledged in both medical and legal spheres in Australia and internationally. There is long-standing scientific evidence demonstrating that exposure to asbestos leading to a diagnosis of an asbestos-related disease can and does arise in non-occupational or environmental settings. For example, in 1960, Wagner and others highlighted mesophilioma cases caused by environmental exposure in South Africa. Newhouse and Thompson identified mesophilioma cases linked to household exposure in London in 1965, and Lieben and Pitaska discussed mesophilioma cases linked to non-occupational exposures in the United States in 1967. While some scientists, officials and lawyers continue to deny or downplay the evidence or significance of third wave sufferers, available evidence on the risks of harmful exposure to legacy asbestos in Australia and homes is, in our view, close to irrefutable. And now we must turn to home renovations. Within the non-occupational exposure risk category, expert warnings on incidents of mesophilia linked to home renovations have been documented since the 1960s. For example, an article in the British Medical Journal in 1967 observed that there is a vast number of do-it-yourself enthusiasts who may be exposed intermittently to highly concentrated asbestos dust. The author notes that in some cases, extremely short exposures have been reported. Warnings from public health scholars and clinicians published within academic sources on the dangers of exposure during home renovations have increased markedly in Australia over the last decade. For example, Franklin and Reed confirms that of all the current exposures, renovations and removals are the most likely to be associated with the disease. Olson and others concluded that instances of malignant mesophilioma after exposure to asbestos during home renovations are an increasing problem in Western Australia and are likely to continue to be because of the many homes that still contain asbestos building products. Olson and others call for active steps to be taken to prevent asbestos-related disease in the residential sector. Park and others also conclude that active steps need to be taken to prevent asbestos-related disease in the residential sector. And similarly, Gray and others conclude that future cases of asbestos-related diseases and mortality can only be prevented by stringent regulation and careful maintenance and removal of existing in-situ asbestos across the country. And more broadly, Lee, 
Driscoll and others conclude that the causal significance of low-dose occupational and non-occupational exposure to mesothelioma cases are often overlooked and they note a reluctance to recognise the causal significance of low occupational and non-occupational exposures and a tendency to ignore or discredit the warnings of scientists. And they also confirm that nearly all human mesothelioma cases result from asbestos exposure, which may be of very small magnitude. Reed concludes that exposure to asbestos from the general environment at levels lower than incurred occupationally has had a catastrophic effect. These warnings from independent experts are strongly supported by the plaintiff compensation claims data. More than half of the successful mesothelioma claims made through the Asbestos Injuries Compensation Fund, the AICF, during the period of 2008-2019 are defined by KPMG, the auditor and actuary of the fund, as arising from home renovation or domestic sources. These claims encompass professional tradespersons, DIY renovators and other domestic cases and the period of exposure of these claimants vary from very long to short. This AICF data is significant as the mesothelioma claims paid by the fund in 2019 equate to nearly 60% of the notified mesothelioma diagnoses in Australia. The primary fact confirmed by the published KPMG data is a majority of mesothelioma claims linked to home renovations in Australia for more than a decade. In fact, these claims may be underrepresented in the KPMG data, as claims involving exposure during home renovations are especially difficult to demonstrate legally. To succeed, a sufferer must prove the specific location and timing of likely exposure and the manufacture of the products containing asbestos. This is not always possible when a person has engaged, for example, in multiple home renovations or has left the relevant property. To reiterate, available claims data suggests that there are many sufferers of asbestos-related diseases in Australia who do not receive any form of compensation, including people with mesothelioma and asbestos-related lung cancer. Now we need to move to the commercial and political influences, because to understand the progress and interpretation of asbestos science and the associated debates properly, scientific findings must be viewed within a broad canvas that encompasses the adjoining commercial, political, legal and academic influences and objectives. Such a perspective is essential because the science of asbestos and the interpretation and dissemination of this science has always been and will continue to be heavily influenced by commercial and political factors. So let's now look at the generally accepted facts about asbestos and the associated deaths. By way of background facts, Australia was the highest per capita user of asbestos-related products worldwide from the 1940s to the 1970s. The World Health Organization describes asbestos exposure deaths as known and preventable and warns countries that if they do not stop using asbestos, that they face an epidemic of cancer in coming years. The areas and amounts of naturally occurring asbestos in Australia that present potential risks to the public are very limited. In contrast, the areas and amounts of asbestos containing materials within public, commercial and residential properties that potentially pose a public health risk are vast. Few Australians have never been exposed to asbestos, so cases with no apparent or known exposures likely involve unrecognised or perhaps forgotten exposures. In terms of asbestosis, medical scholars highlighted the links between asbestos exposure and asbestosis as early as 1900, with increasing studies published during the 1920s and 1930s internationally and in Australia. 
the occurrence of asbestosis outside of asbestos industry workers was highlighted in the medical literature in the 1960s. While asbestosis is a notifiable disease in Australia, our researchers were unable to find publicly available statistics on the levels of diagnoses. Publicly available evidence on the past and present death counts from asbestosis in Australia, therefore, is lacking. Now, turning to mesothelioma, Australia has the highest per capita level of mesothelioma in the world. The latency period for mesothelioma is somewhere between 10 and 50 years. Most of the pertinent medical knowledge about mesothelioma was published in the 1960s, including the facts that it can occur from low dosages and brief periods of exposure. Medical researchers confirm that few common cancers have such a direct causal relation with an exposure to a defined carcinogen as mesothelioma has with asbestos exposure, even lung cancer with cigarette smoking. Unlike most other diseases, mesothelioma is not associated with smoking or any personal responsibility issues. Most, if not all, mesothelioma sufferers did nothing to contribute to their death. Mesothelioma is incurable and there is no effective long-term treatments. Mesothelioma has been described by a medical professor as the most terrible cancer known, in which the decline is the most spectacular, the most cruel. Mesothelioma is a notifiable disease in Australia and diagnoses have been formally recorded since 1982. The five-year survival rate for mesothelioma in Australia is 5 to 6 percent and that's the lowest such rate amongst the cancer types recorded by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. This survival rate has barely moved over the past 30 years. Multiple published medical sources suggest that around 20,000 Australians have died from mesothelioma since 1945. The recorded mesothelioma diagnoses in Australia rose rapidly from 125 in 1982 to around 700 to 800 in 2020. From 2012 to 2019, annual mesophilia diagnoses and deaths were in the range of 700 to 800. Cancer Australia estimates that notified diagnoses of mesophilia in 2020 will be around 834. If accurate, this level of diagnoses will be 15% higher than the reported statistic by the AMR for 2019 and will exceed all prior equivalent levels. The Cancer Australia 2020 estimate includes record mesothelioma diagnoses for both males and females, and the ages of people dying from mesothelioma in Australia span from 19 to 101, with an average age of diagnosis of 75 years in 2019. Outside of Australia, there are recorded instances of people as young as 14 with mesothelioma. People are dying from mesothelioma in all Australian states and territories. The floating fibres of asbestos do not respect job classifications. The backgrounds of people that have died and are dying from mesothelioma in Australia are diverse and include people from all such economic and educational categories. Now turning to lung cancer. Links between asbestos and lung cancer were acknowledged by medical scholars in the 1930s to 1950s. Asbestos is a contributing and exacerbating risk factor for lung cancer. In 1964, a study by Selikoff and others showed that asbestos workers who smoked had 90 times the risk of developing an asbestos-related cancer than non-smokers with no exposure to asbestos. An updated study on the linkage between asbestos smoking and lung cancer concludes that any asbestos exposure, even in heavy smokers, contributes to causation. A body of medical studies investigate the ratio of cases of lung cancer deaths caused by exposure to asbestos 
compared to mesothelioma fatalities. These study findings vary with ratios spanning from 2 to 6.6 .6 times. Applying those study ratios, the estimated deaths from asbestos-related lung cancer in Australia since 1945 ranges from 40,000 to 132,000. Close to 9,000 people die from lung cancer each year in Australia. The published medical ratio suggests around 3,000 of those deaths involve asbestos exposure. The actual number of deaths in Australia from asbestos-related lung cancer is unknown. Lung cancer deaths are not generally investigated and the causal interactions between asbestos and other factors are complex. The average five-year survival rate for lung cancer in Australia is around 19%. This survival rate has improved by an absolute 8% over the past 30 years. Now let's look at occupational exposure. Existing and past sufferers of asbestosis, mesothelioma and asbestos-related lung cancer in Australia were exposed and continue to be exposed from occupational sources including males and females. Occupational exposure to asbestos arises when the primary source of exposure leading to a diagnosis of an asbestos-related disease occurs in the workplace setting. Asbestos has been and continues to be the most lethal known occupational carcinogen globally. Asbestos exposure remains the number one cause of work-related deaths in the world. And asbestos-related diseases have likely been the single largest cause of workplace deaths in Australia over the last decade. Now let's look at non-occupational or environmental exposure. Existing and past sufferers of mesothelioma in Australia were exposed and continue to be exposed from non-occupational sources, including males and females. Non-occupational or environmental exposure to asbestos arises when the primary source of exposure leading to a diagnosis of an asbestos-related disease occurs in settings that are not workplace related. For example, exposure may arise during home renovations or in a school or building site or linked to commercial or public spaces. Many participants in the AMR survey provide histories of non-occupational sources of exposure to asbestos. Of the 952 surveyed participants from 2008 to 2019, nearly 36% were assessed as having no occupational exposure and another 52% were found to have both occupational and non-occupational exposures. Medical studies find excess risks of mesothelioma in neighbourhoods, domestic settings and homes. And Marsh and others conclude that mesothelioma risks from non-occupational asbestos exposure are consistent with the fibre type potency response observed in occupational settings. Turning to exposure during home renovations, published material from public health scholars and clinicians confirms that the greatest risk of exposure to legacy asbestos occurs when buildings are renovated or demolished. Warnings from public health scholars and clinicians within academic sources on the risks of exposure during home renovations leading to mesothelioma have increased markedly over the last decade. In contrast, warnings in Australia from public health officials at both federal and state levels remain equivocal, dated and poorly disseminated. Many participants in the AMR survey provide histories of home renovation experiences. The most common contexts in which those occurred were the undertaking of major home renovations that involved asbestos products, more than 50%, and living in a house undergoing renovations at 39%. More than 52% of the settled mesothelioma claims with the Asbestos Injuries Compensation Fund from 2008 to 2019 involved home renovations, with the equivalent statistics rising to 60% in 2018 and 55% in 2019. Most published work from medical researchers in Australia suggests the composition of mesothelioma sufferers in Australia is broadening, with a significant decrease in the pool of men working in factories and mines with asbestos-containing products, and a corresponding increase in the number of male and female sufferers with likely harmful exposure 
during home renovations. Our researchers found only one published article that describes the scientific evidence for the existence of the hypothesized third wave as limited. The authors of this article suggest the composition of the AMR participant sample is biased, but provide no evidence to support that claim. And our research suggests that the AMR data on non-occupational exposure is most likely to understate rather than overstate the incidence of home renovation exposures. First, the initial phase of the survey seeks written responses encompassing only traditional exposure sources, including occupational settings and the passing of asbestos dust from those settings to families. Further information regarding possible non-occupational exposure is gathered only during the final telephone interview phase of the survey. And second, many of the survey participants would have already met with personal injury lawyers and would be aware that compensation is more readily obtainable when exposure can be linked to incidents at a workplace. In any event, the evidence provided by participants ought not to be readily dismissed as biased. Otherwise, this research is wasting the precious remaining time of sufferers. The authors of the article, which question the level of scientific evidence on the third wave, seemingly assumed that home renovation activities potentially result in excess mesophilia incidents across the population are confined to the cutting, drilling, or sanding of asbestos sheeting. Turning now to females diagnosed with asbestos-related diseases, the specific research on female sufferers of asbestos-related diseases is frankly scarce. Studies on the environmental exposure of residences at Whittenham confirm the excess cancer risks of women and children who worked or lived in Whittenham. Reed concludes that exposure to asbestos from the general environment at levels lower than incurred occupationally has had a catastrophic effect. Among the female participants in the AMR survey to the end of 2019, 93% were assessed as having no known or recognised occupational exposure. Hence, a high proportion of the sufferers with identified home renovation histories and that were assessed as having no probable exposure sources were likely female. In 2020, a majority of the estimated diagnoses of mesophilioma were still male. However, the Cancer Australia estimates of 185 female diagnoses is a 34% increase on the equivalent statistic published in the 2019 AMR report. Reasons for this marked change in the gender balance are unclear. There is evidence of gender bias responses to females when seeking diagnoses of and compensation for asbestos-related diseases. Now we need to come to talk about the commercial and political influences on asbestos-related science. Braun and others conclude that the network of entities that worked together to obscure the hazards of asbestos included biomedical researchers, multinational companies, academic institutions and nation states. And Braun and others suggest that the asbestos industry deployed a range of international strategies to control the population and dissemination of knowledge about asbestos. Such strategies include direct suppression of data from industry-sponsored research, selective publication of research findings, and the systematic use of scientific knowledge to create uncertainty. The authors note the willing participation of scientists in those endeavours. Soberg and others suggest that the asbestos ban in 2003 in Australia was a significant victory for the trade union movement, but unfortunately represented a story of the lack of political will by governments at federal and state level to act in the health interests of their community. James Huff concludes that covert influence on occupation and environmental health policies has turned brazenly 
overt. More than ever before, the OEH community is witnessing the perverse influence and increasing control by industry interests. And he argues that the science of occupational environmental medicine, toxicology and epidemiology will remain unsatisfactory whilst much of it is funded and manipulated by industry sponsors and published in journals that do not require disclosure of conflicts of interests. Now, there are a significant number of uncertainties unknown. For example, when will the number of deaths in Australia from asbestos-related diseases peak? Prior predictions of peaks in the 1990s, 2000s and 2010s were unduly optimistic and significantly so. Or again, the reasons why some people develop asbestos-related diseases while others do not. This conundrum applies to many, if not all, diseases. For example, not all smokers develop lung cancer or other smoking-related diseases. But similarly, scientists do not understand why only some people contract COVID-19. Only some of those people become severely ill and only some transmit the virus to others. Or again, scientific mechanisms for sufferers of asbestos-related diseases or others to precisely establish or confirm the exact timing, source and duration of exposure to asbestos, especially those exposed from non-occupational sources. Medical studies that examine non-occupational sources of exposure to asbestos are difficult to design, assess and verify because the exposure settings, including the timing, duration and intensive exposure, are highly variable and specific. Or again, the possible confounding of scientific study results because of background exposures to asbestos. While medical studies measure the excess risks of asbestos-related diseases, the control groups are comprised of people from the general population. Expansive production and use of asbestos-containing materials by James Hardy, CSR and others in the 20th century mean that most, if not all, Australians have been exposed to asbestos fibres to some extent. Hence, ongoing levels of exposure across the population, typically called the background or incidental rate of exposure, are reflected in the comparative control data and may confound or mask findings classified by scientists as excess risks across the population. So let's now turn to our summary and views. Scientific evidence on the danger of asbestos exposure to human health and life, the causal linkages between exposure and asbestos-related diseases, the death counts from those diseases, and the sources and levels of exposure leading to asbestos-related diseases have been well documented and published in scientific material since the 1960s. Indeed, the science on asbestos-related diseases is clearer in many respects than for many other diseases and areas of public health. Most of this evidence on health outcomes, sources of exposure, and the past and present death counts is largely irrefutable. But, despite the clarity of the science over many decades, some industry and other moneyed interests continue to portray the science on asbestos-related diseases as uncertain or incomplete. As has occurred since the beginning of the asbestos crisis, these vested interests present their carefully selected versions of the science, often based on unsourced and anonymous assertions, as a means to mask the continuing crisis, and especially the mass loss of life. As McCulloch and Tweedle note, the asbestos industry never had problems finding physicians and epidemiologists ready to argue that the risk of working with asbestos was acceptable. Scientific evidence on deadly exposure to legacy asbestos in homes extends back to the 1960s. Compensation claims data and plenty of lawyers confirm that the majority of mesophilia claims since 2008 relate to exposure within homes. Corresponding warnings from public health researchers and others have increased over the last decade. Consequently, the facts, evidence and science that necessitate urgent public health and policy action to save lives from asbestos-related diseases in Australian homes are to hand and have been to hand for more than a decade. Today, there are still scientists and others who 
who claim that community risks of exposure to legacy asbestos are low or acceptable, especially in non-occupational settings. These risk claims, including those within the public guidance, are based on incidence rates and fail to convey or explain the real and substantive possibility of death and the ongoing death counts from asbestos-related diseases. To avoid accountability, the personnel making such claims often remain anonymous and or are protected behind walls of silence. For example, the Asbestos Guide to Householders and the Public in Australia is unsourced. Its contributors are not identified and its content is copyright protected. Most official sources in Australia continue to dismiss or play down the ongoing risks of deadly exposure to legacy asbestos by promulgating or emphasising the same or similar misconceptions or half-truths that have been used by the industry and its supporters since the 1970s, namely that the incidence of and deaths from asbestos-related diseases are rare, the number of historical deaths from asbestos-related diseases are uncertain, asbestos-related diseases require or usually involve intense exposure over long periods. Asbestos-related diseases are solely or primarily caused by occupational exposures. Causes of asbestos-related diseases cases today reflect historical settings that no longer exist. That most exposure of the general Australian population to asbestos and the comparative intense exposure levels used in scientific modelling is caused by naturally occurring asbestos and public health messaging on asbestos risks should be disseminated on a limited basis so as not to scare the community and legacy asbestos products that are bonded or encapsulated are safe and best left in position and it's safer to manage than to remove in situ asbestos. To gain credence, the above claims are generally presented as scientifically verifiable, grounded on public health concerns as a fair and accurate representation of the scientific community. And as the consensus of experts, we discuss each of these claims in detail in future papers. But in summary, our research suggests published science and arguments to support the above claims are, well, frankly, weak, non-existent. As two Australian public health scholars noted in 2003, there is a reluctance to recognise the causal significance of low occupational and non-occupational exposures to asbestos and a tendency to ignore or to discredit the warnings of scientists. The burden of publicly refuting or rebutting claims based on incomplete or alleged scientific basis is often led to victims of asbestos-related diseases and those supporting or advocating on behalf of those sufferers. These groups face enormous challenges and headwinds in the scientific and evidential debates within academic and public forums because access to these debates is often blocked by the industry and its political and commercial supporters. As other scholars highlight, vested interests continue to attempt to firstly control or manipulate channels of scientific and research endeavours and outputs, to suppress, contest or undermine publicly available data that does not serve their interests, to exclude victims of asbestos-related diseases or their supporters from the alleged expert debates. John McCulloch noted in 1986 that the politicisation of science is used by industry to immobilise debate by excluding the victims and the public from participation in the conflict. That exclusion is a political strategy which is rarely, if ever, justified by the nature of the explanation involved or by the methodology physicians use in researching diseases and their causes. What needs to be done is to transfer the asbestos controversy into the public arena so that the issue is no longer seen or defined as a technical problem for experts in the legal, medical, technocratic and bureaucratic spheres to debate unhindered by an informed public. McCulloch's conclusion remains present today. The continued exclusion of sufferers and the public from the official bodies and processes relating to asbestos diseases in Australia is long-standing and purposeful. This exclusion enables the industry and other moneyed and political interests to control the processes, the people involved, and the information released publicly.
During the 20th century, the creation and continuation of the asbestos industry in Australia was repeatedly justified on short-term commercial and political grounds with loss of life viewed by those making these gains as a necessary cost of doing business. This pattern continues today. Our research suggests anonymous experts who can be carefully selected or influenced are still largely determining the acceptable level of risks and deaths from exposure to legacy asbestos for the Australian community. While those with short-term financial and political capital to protect can hide in the shadows and dominate the policy debates around asbestos matters, tens of thousands more Australians will continue to die from entirely preventable diseases without repercussion or accountability. The most tragic aspect of this framework is that science, or pseudoscience, is being used as a smokescreen to block or confuse genuine scientific developments and public health debates that serve the public interest. For open and robust debate to occur on the science of asbestos, all contributors or participants need to be clearly identifiable and required to disclose any conflicts of interest or relevant external funding. Further, all official material on asbestos matters that claims to be scientifically verifiable needs to provide the detailed sources relied upon. All asbestos-related scientific and policy debates need to occur in public forums and not behind closed doors. To the credit of the scientific community, dedicated persons have highlighted the risks of exposure to asbestos, the dire health outcomes, and the undue influence of commercial interest on asbestos matters throughout the crisis period. These scientists deserve high commendation, but more is needed. To prevent continued mass loss of life to asbestos-related diseases during this century and the next, even stronger voices and actions are needed. Policy around the handling control of asbestos in Australia is incomplete, especially in the residential sector, and robust debates on the most appropriate public health frameworks to prevent or minimise deaths from asbestos-related diseases are lacking within both academic and other sources. We urge the scientific community to systematically rebut the long-standing misconceptions promulgated by anonymous experts and muddied interests as scientifically sound. Speak openly and unequivocally about the substantive risks of exposure to legacy asbestos, especially in Australian homes, and demand concrete actions and policy reforms to prevent or minimise future incidences of asbestos-related diseases in Australia. Mm -hmm.